Hello, welcome to March Leadership 2023. My name is Crystal Rowland and I'm the Director of the Division of Program Standards in the Office of Teaching and Learning. We're glad that you could join us today. During today's session, we'll be sharing updates and resources from the Office of Teaching and Learning to promote equity and access through strengthening Tier 1 instruction. Our March leadership meetings began in 2019 as in-person meetings across the state to share critical information and resources around the Kentucky academic standards and their implementation. As with many events, the COVID-19 pandemic required a transition to online offerings. And while virtual sessions provide a great deal of flexibility, they fall short of providing the rich opportunities for collaboration that naturally arise during in-person meetings. As such, this year, the March leadership meetings were hosted in person at each of the eight regional educational cooperatives. So we'd like to take a moment to say thank you to those educational cooperatives for providing space and accommodation. We appreciate your partnership. This session is designed to provide opportunities to reflect and discuss. Throughout this session, directions will be given to support those viewing together as a leadership team, as well as directions for those who may be viewing individually. We'd love to hear from you about your experience with today's session. At the end of the recording, there will be a QR code for a survey. Please take a moment to complete the survey to assist us in planning for next year's offerings. Materials you will need for this session are located in your Google folder. You should find there a copy of the following, a participant handout, which is like an organizer for the session, and it will provide you space for you to capture your thinking at different points. Sample instructional visions from three Kentucky districts. From Anchorage Independent, we have a reading and writing instructional vision. We have mathematics from Powell County and social studies from Woodford County. HQIR rationale, rationale slides PDF, and this is, this is handy if you print them out either for annotation during the session or perhaps to have in hand to support conversations in district afterward. The curriculum development process communication plan template, and then draft Kentucky, uh, Kentucky academic standards at a glance documents for social studies and for science. We will use each of these during this session. If having the documents printed is helpful, you can pause and print them now. An overarching idea for our session is the need for instructional coherence. As we continue to move forward with a focus on accelerating and deepening student learning, a critical step in this work is to strengthen instructional coherence at the district, school, and classroom levels. Now, research shows schools that are able to establish increased instructional coherence demonstrate marked improvements in student performance. Establishing this coherence requires intentional coordination of support, strategies, and initiatives across the local system. Districts tend to have a complex array of systems, initiatives, programs, and practices. MTSS promotes coherence and alignment across those multiple systems and initiatives so that our efforts are enhanced by integration rather than being diminished by fragmentation. Effectively implemented MTSS creates a system for the delivery of high quality instruction, intervention, and supports so the full range of student needs can be identified and addressed. Now, there are many ways to develop an integrated MTSS, and the decision of how to do so will be dependent on local circumstances and needs. One of the first steps, however, is to build clarity around the six essential elements of MTSS. Looking at the visual on the left, you can see at the center is a tiered delivery system with supports to address academic, behavioral, and social emotional domains. And these can be thought of as maybe the what of MTSS. Surrounding this are four more process-based elements, maybe the how of MTSS, and they are collaborative problem-solving teams, data-based decision-making, evidence-based instruction, intervention, and supports, and then family, school, and community partnerships. The last element is equitable access and opportunity, and this can be thought of as maybe the effect that MTSS is trying to achieve or produce, and it surrounds all other components of the framework, but also sort of permeates within. The screenshot on the right highlights a new resource now available, the KYMTSS self-assessment tool. Aligned with Kentucky's six essential elements, it is designed to guide and help teams assess progress toward full MTSS implementation. The KYMTSS website functions as the toolkit for all things MTSS. To access the self-assessment tool, simply click on the resource library and then click on the self-assessment tool. 
right above right above the self-assessment tool is the KYMTSS implementation guide. The self-assessment tool and the implementation guide work together in concert as you identify possible areas to engage through the self-assessment tool and then utilize the implementation guide to address those targeted areas. Finally, note the nudge to sign up for the KYMTSS newsletter circled here in red. At the core of an effective MTSS framework is strong tier one instruction, and that is where we're going to focus our time. Looking at how local curriculum grounded in high quality instructional resources can strengthen tier one instruction for all students. This figure helps us envision how the strengthening of tier one instruction happens through the curriculum development process. Moving from the visioning work of co-crafting with stakeholders and instructional vision for teaching and learning in a content area to the impact via the three spaces between of improved student outcomes. We will return to this throughout the session for the anchor points it provides. And that brings us to the purpose of our session. For our session goal, we are learning about the importance of a strong local curriculum supported by high quality instructional resources to help strengthen tier one instruction. In section one, we're going to establish the importance of a common instructional vision for teaching and learning in a content area. In section two, we will look at the role of high quality instructional resources in supporting a strong standards aligned curriculum and explore resources to help guide selection at the local level. In section three, we will consider stakeholder communication and inclusion throughout the curriculum development process. Then in section four, we will provide you with a standards update for science and social studies. As you consider today's agenda, what might your goal for the day be given your role and current focuses in your school or district? We'll take a minute for you to capture a goal on your participant handout, and this should be right at the top of page one. If you are reviewing this recording individually, pause the video and record your goal. If you are viewing this recording with the team, afterward we would like you to do a quick single round robin and give each person a chance to share their goal in relation to our focus for the day. So let's move into section one, where we're going to take a closer look at the importance of having a common instructional vision in place for each content area. And for this section, we have two objectives and we're going to tackle those at the same time. So we want to explore some sample instructional visions from three Kentucky districts and then based on that exploration, discuss potential impacts a common instructional vision can have on tier one instruction. Going back to that visual that again, we're going to use and come back to over and over today. If we want to strengthen tier one instruction and improve student outcomes, we first have to ensure that we even have a common vision for what teaching and learning in a content area should look like and that we have that in place in classrooms across our district. And that is the purpose of phase two of KDE's curriculum development process that's outlined in the model curriculum framework. So in phase two, the first responsibility of the district curriculum development team that was formed back in phase one is to engage in a collaborative analysis that will be used as the basis for drafting the instructional vision for the content area focus. And this was one of the major lessons learned that districts participating in both our reading and writing and math pilots shared with us as they implemented the curriculum development process. They consistently spoke to how the work of creating that local common instructional vision for the content area really then allowed them to use that vision as the main driver for the rest of the process. And it was something they were able to come back to over and over again. And so when creating an instructional vision, there are three important lenses that we recommend you focus on and ensure are reflected throughout. And these three lenses, this would be the focus of that collaborative analysis that the uh, curriculum development team would um, undertake. So lens one is to ensure that your vision is aligned to the Kentucky academic standards for the content area and the foundational beliefs built within those standards. The second is to ensure that the vision is aligned to the current research for teaching and learning in the content area. So not about what we may think or feel to be true or based on just the way we've always approached teaching and learning in the content area, but rather aligned to the research on what has been shown to improve student outcomes. And then that third lens is to take into account your local context, the needs of your community and the uniqueness of your student population. 
we want to give you an opportunity to explore some sample instructional visions from three Kentucky school districts. And again, we just want to thank these districts for um, giving us permission to share these out during our March leadership meetings. So in your uh, materials, you should have a reading and writing example from Anchorage. They refer to this as their literacy framework. You have a math example from Powell County. And then you have a social studies example from Woodford County. So take just a moment to locate each of these in your participant Google folder, and you're going to want to open each one of them up in their own tab on your computer or have the hard copies that you uh, printed off. Just have those in front of you ready to go. We first want to give you an opportunity to individually explore the three visions. And as you explore, we want you to take note of what just stands out to you as you examine those three visions. So what are things that are resonating with you, um, things that you notice across the three visions or things that seem really important to you as you look at each of those? So please feel free to annotate directly on the visions if you have them printed out or you can capture your thinking on your participant handout. Pause the video now and restart after your individual exploration. If you are viewing the video with a team, we recommend that you take turns sharing out your noticings using a continuous round robin where you're just going to share one idea per turn. So please pause the video and restart after that team share out. So based on your noticings from your exploration, we would like for you to reflect on the two questions you're going to see here on the slide. First, Think about what potential impacts a common instructional vision can have for the different stakeholders back in your district. So again, thinking about what might be the potential impact on students, teachers, parents, leaders, community members, as well as your site-based council and board members. For the second question, we want you to begin now to create some sensory images. So if you had a common instructional vision in place through the lens of your local context, what do you imagine that might be like? So if you begin to really visualize and paint this picture in your mind, what are some of the things that you might see, hear, and or feel back in your district? There is space on page one of your participant handout to capture your thinking. So again, what might be some potential impacts for the different stakeholders? And as you begin to really imagine those impacts, what might you see, hear, and or feel across your district if you had common instructional visions in place? So please pause the video and uh, restart after responding to the reflection questions. In thinking about potential impacts of a common instructional vision, they really do serve as your North Star or your guiding light. So they're what you're striving for. It doesn't mean that they're, uh, you're there yet, um, but they focus on that vibrant student experience that you want to see in each content area in all classrooms across your district. They also ensure that everyone throughout the district is aligned to and working from a common uh, language and a shared understanding of the observable indicators of your vision in action at the district, the school, and the classroom levels. The vision should also guide decision making around curriculum, instructional resources, and professional learning. And that goes back to kind of the theme of this uh, session, which is about strengthening that coherence within your tier one instruction. And then finally, these are something that you want to see as like living documents. So something that you would regularly revisit and update as needed. Now, as we have gone around the state, um, for our March leadership meetings, we've recognized that the idea of instructional uh, visions have really created kind of a sense of urgency in some of the leaders, and people are excited to get back and thinking they want to immediately create instructional visions for all of their content areas, like right now. But if you go into the introduction to the curriculum development process, we recommend that you tackle one to two content areas per year, because remember, this work is in phase two of a four-phase process. By focusing on only one to two content areas per year, it really helps to make the work more manageable for you as a district leader in terms of like facilitating the work and thinking through things like time, um, money and resources. It also helps to make it more manageable for your teachers to have the time and space necessary to really deepen their understanding of a vision and how that really impacts their classroom instruction. So in terms of where to start, we recommend that you just look at your local data and determine in which content area do you most need to improve student outcomes and start there. 
In terms of supports that we have to um, help you as you create those instructional visions for each content area, the way that we have structured and formatted the curriculum development process document in and of itself is meant to be a support for you. So for every single step of the process, you're going to find three things within it. The first is going to be just a little bit of text that's going to give you the purpose and just a brief description of what you need to know about that particular step. The next is going to be key questions that you would want to address and really think through in terms of making sure that you get out of that step what it was intended to do and how it really supports then the overall process. And then finally, there are some key tools, and this is just going to provide you with things like protocols, templates, examples of instructional vision to really help you as you implement that particular step back at the local level. In the curriculum development process document, there's also an Appendix A, and this is where we created a, another toolkit to go along with each phase. Now, phase one is very logistical in nature. We have been focusing on phase two around really articulating that instructional vision. So the support that you will find here in the first column, it's going to contain a professional learning module that you and others in your district can engage in to really deepen your understanding of around instructional visions and what is kind of outlined in the curriculum development process to help you arrive at that instructional vision. The second column is going to contain um, examples of instructional vision. So in addition to the three that you looked at during this session, there are also some other examples in there, and we're going to continue to build that out as we gather more examples from around the state. And then that last column is just some quick video clips from districts participating in our pilots where they're reflecting on their experience in the work of that particular phase um, and advice that they might offer other schools or districts wanting to undertake that work. Our second section <clears throat> focuses on the role of HQIRs within a strong local curriculum. Our first objective for section two is to build rationale for using high quality instructional resources to support implementation of a locally developed curriculum. Now, this is important for leaders to know for themselves, but also for them to be able to facilitate effective research based conversations about high quality instructional resources in your local context. Returning to the graphic, we are in the second space now. HQIRs are selected according to how well they can enable the local curriculum to actualize a district's instructional vision, and once adopted, access to them becomes a matter of process, of systems, structures, planning, and high-quality professional learning. Phase three of the curriculum development process proceeds then from the instructional vision as the team selects a primary HQIR or primary HQIRs, plural. Step one of phase three focuses on how selection happens, but let's pause here and think together about the role of HQIRs. We will use this section, why HQIRs, to explore findings from research in order to offer a rationale for using HQIRs to help address ways curriculum isn't yet serving students. The need to make the case for what necess necessitates curriculum change especially with teachers invested in curriculum they have been using and may have created, consistently comes up in this work. Over the next nine slides, pay attention to what connects with you from the perspective of prior experiences, and maybe even to some of the particular people and circumstances that come up. You have a PDF of the slides in the Google folder if that's helpful to have printed for annotation or to come back to later. For procedure here, I will read the headlining sum summary for each slide, give its source, and then pause a moment for silent processing before I add a little high-level commentary. After these slides, I will invite you to reflect on connections you found, so either making some mental notes or holding thinking as annotations on the PDF or on some scratch paper may be helpful. So for our first slide, instructional resources are central to student learning, and this is from the Brookings Institution. So why are instructional resources so central to student learning? Now, this is an important question. The graphic on the left shows how many factors impinge upon the instructional core of materials. Um, and nationally, in that conversation, they'll talk about instructional materials. In Kentucky, we talk about instructional resources, but materials and resources are synonymous. They're used pretty in interchangeably. 
Um, so we think about that instructional core of materials or resources, and then we have teacher and student in the center. We can imagine then within that instructional core, the direct impact, impact materials or resources have on teaching and learning. But as we see the quote on the right, there is also an indirect impact, that of influencing teachers' choices and practices as they prepare and facilitate the learning. Resources are a top priority for teachers. And this is from Scholastic. So their report found these to be the top funding priorities identified by teachers. The shortcomings of current materials are not just noticed by researchers and district leads. Teachers, those using instructional resources every day with their students, are clear those resources are not yet aligned and they would prioritize funding for high quality instructional resources if given the choice. So as much as teachers might feel a need for more boots on the ground support for additional staff in districts and schools, or even for higher salaries, they recognize the urgency of access to better resources. Teachers spend seven to 12 hours per week searching for and creating resources. And this is from Rand. So where do teachers go when searching for and creating resources? Of necessity, they often, they often resort to websites like Google and Pinterest, and we know Teachers Pay Teachers um, also gets a, a good bit of site traffic. And these websites offer resources that are unvetted that teachers then have to try to cobble together. This consumes valuable time for a yield that's low in quality and without much classroom to classroom coherence. Teachers spent significant time creating or selecting their own assignments, but not often with good results. This is from the new teacher project TNTP's The Opportunity Myth. So this report again underscores how much of teachers time, 250 hours per year, is consumed by seeking or creating assignments. Now, quick clarification here is to note that in Kentucky, the state does not create or select assignments. When we look at district and teacher created or selected assignments, the graphs illustrate how these resources found or made tend to fall short in grade level alignment with only 34% of district created or selected assignments and 20% of teacher created or selected assignments on grade level. And while district selected or created assignments uh, may give more system-wide coherence, they still tend to fall short in grade level alignment 66% of the time. Um, they all, we also notice in subject specific practices with only 24% of district created or selected assignments and only 13% of teacher created or selected assignments, allowing students access to disciplinary practices. And then in authentic connection with only 20% of district created selected assignments or 16% of teacher created or selected assignments, helping students make rich connections to big ideas and to the world. Supplemental online resources show weak alignment and limited student supports. And this is from the Fordham Institute. The Fordham study examined over 300 of the most downloaded materials across three of the most popular supplemental websites, and they were looking for alignment to standards, coherence of materials, and then materials for students needing additional support. The report shows that while lessons may be somewhat aligned to the intent of the standards, most provide little to no support for differentiation, which was identified as one of the primary reasons teachers search for supplements. Vital supports for increasing equity or for fostering social emotional learning would also be largely absent for most resources found online. Supplemental online resources tend to be low DOK. This is from the Fordham Institute again from the same source. When reviewers evaluated supplemental materials found online for depth of knowledge, which as we know, is the cognitive demand required of students to successfully engage with the content, and they need that cognitive demand to build capacity, 
most of the content included in the main activity of each was DOK level one or two, which is basic recall and reproduction, basic skills and knowledge. Nearly half of the main activities had no DOK level three content, which is where we'd find strategic and critical thinking, and 94% had no DOK level four content, which is the extended or applied thinking that we really want for our students. Student success on assignments versus mastery of grade level standards on those assignments. And now we're back to TNTP. TNTP's assignment analysis demonstrated that even when students are somewhat successful on classroom assignments, as they were found to be 71% of the time here, if those assignments are not properly aligned to grade level standards, students are not prepared for the rigors of future college level coursework. Most of us have been in classrooms where the instructional moves seem strong, engagement is high, and learners appear to experience success. If, however, the texts and tasks students experience aren't on grade level, the readiness we assume to be conferred there isn't. Students have inconsistent access to grade level appropriate resources, and this is TNTP again. And think about this slide from the perspective of, of a student, either being a student yourself or from a student you might know in the K-12 system. So this slide shows Students are spending 581 of 720 hours on assignments, which is equivalent to 81% of their school years on assignments that are not grade level appropriate or low in quality. And this is especially significant for students of color and students living in poverty. This is our final slide. Access to quality resources also matters to students beyond high school. This is from TNTP again. So there are economic impacts as well of the lack of high quality instructional resources, impacts that extend beyond high school. We find a student center college, 40% take at least one remedial course, which comes at cost, 1.5 billion annually to students and their families, and takes up valuable time. Now these costs are steepest for our students of color. Graduates entering the workforce right out of high school struggle too, as they find themselves missing skills required to be successful there. There was a lot of information on those nine slides and the implications of it are a lot to process. Let's do some of that processing here. After taking a moment to review and think, and please feel free to flip back through any notes you may have taken, we will reflect in lieu of the round of open forum team discussion shown on this slide if you're working independently. So for that reflection, from the perspective of your experience, what connected with you? And then also, did any of the information seem especially surprising? Whether you want to compose internally and just think it through or jot down some of your thinking, please consider these prompts. Since things have now been brought to focus on the essential role of high quality instructional resources, let's set KDE's general definition of HQIR. So first we see, of course, aligned with the Kentucky academic standards. Then we see research-based and or externally validated. We hear a little bit more about how ed reports can be used later and content areas they're currently supporting. We'll also hear about our instructional resources alignment rubrics and how they can offer a support. Third, comprehensive to include engaging texts, tasks, and assessments based on fostering vibrant student learning experiences. And here's a connection to United We Learn. We'll talk about that again later as well. And then the last two connect to equity, culturally relevant and free from bias and accessible for all students. And as we think about these, we can begin to see how these characteristics can address shortcomings that curriculum students have access often need to have addressed. So a team from KDE recently attended a convening of the IMPD, the Instructional Materials Professional Development Network in Nashville. This slide, this slide was shared by the Louisiana Department of Education team. Adopting a primary HQIR uh, and utilizing effective curriculum-based professional learning, we'll talk about curriculum-based professional learning here in a bit, allowed Louisiana to lead the nation in change in NAEP average scale score for reading grade four from 2019 to 2022. 
especially uh, impressive when considering they began near the other end of the table and when we recall the presence of a pandemic during that time. This can offer us a testament to the power of effective curriculum and high quality instructional resources at, with implementation backed also by high quality professional learning. So this screenshot looks at HQR access in Kentucky from an internal dashboard. Uh, just a note, it is not connected to the Legislative Research Commission, the LRC, LRC survey mentioned in a recent commissioner's uh, Monday message. Information we have is based on voluntary completion of a survey. It shows two years data in reading and writing and one for math. We can see that we have data from 114 districts with 66% of districts and 49% of schools having responded to the reading, writing, and math surveys. As we dig in a bit, there are some things we don't know yet. A large number of unreported means we do not currently know the state of curriculum there, for example. But we do know that of the districts that have responded, 75% have selected at least one HQIR for reading and writing, and 85% at least one for math. So district HQIR coordinators completing the survey gain access to the dashboard, and we gain access to additional data. Um, and with access to the dashboard, there are other pages that show, for example, which resources are being used around the state, um, which op could open up the possibility of some really potent networking. So again, this is just a tool to promote awareness and collaboration and not for monitoring or accountability. So now we're going to move into the second objective here in section two, where we want to highlight KDE's consumer guide. And just as a reminder, so we're still focusing here on number two. Um, we know, first of all, if we're going to uh, strengthen tier one instruction and improve student outcomes, we start with making sure we have a common instructional vision in place. Fox just talked about the rationale for ensuring that teachers and students have access to high quality instructional resources that are aligned to your local instructional vision. And now we just want to spotlight resources we have to support districts in selecting HQIRs. And as Fox mentioned earlier, selecting uh, instructional resources is a part of step one of phase three of the curriculum development process. Now this step is where the content area consumer guides fit in. So the curriculum development process itself provides general guidance that can be applied to each and every content area. Whereas the consumer guides are going to focus on and provide more content specific characteristics for high quality instructional resources. Now we are going to walk you through the format and the organization of our reading and writing consumer guide. This format and organization will be the same in our other content area consumer guides because we want to maintain consistency across those documents. So we're using the reading and writing consumer guide as an example today. So when you get into that guide, it's going to start with an introduction that's just going to provide some background context connections to the curriculum development process and a little bit of the rationale around HQIRs. The second section is what makes this unique to the particular content area because it is going to focus on characteristics of high quality, in this case, reading and writing resources. So that section is going to start by framing around KDE's general definition of HQIRs that Fox showed you just a minute ago. And now then it's going to focus on, well, what would that look like in reading and writing? So the next subsection is going to lay out the markers, and this is what you would want to use as you evaluate resources to ensure alignment to the Kentucky academic standards for reading and writing. So the markers are about standards alignment, which is that first characteristic in KDE's general definition of HQIRs. The last subsection here will lay out the five equity lenses with the reading and writing look force to support districts in evaluating resources to see are they culturally relevant, free from bias, and accessible for all students. So again, going back to that uh, general definition of HQIRs. The third section in the consumer guide, it is actually going to be the same as phase three, step one in the curriculum development process with one difference. It will contain some content specific tools to support the selection process at the local level. Now, the consumer guide is going to point to ed reports as a possible starting point for identifying externally validated HQIRs for reading and writing and for math. Now, in case you're not familiar with ed reports, they are a nonprofit organization that often really they're described as kind of like the consumer reports of instructional resources. 
And their um, instructional review teams consist of five practicing educators um, that are selected for their content area expertise, and they reflect a diversity of roles, regions, and grade levels. And those reviewers will spend over 150 hours reviewing a particular resource, and every reviewer has to review every single page of the resource. So in the consumer guide, we have provided a video tutorial and other resources to support districts in navigating EdReport's website to really help identify and evaluate some potential green rated HQIRs for adoption consideration. The Reading and Writing Consumer Guide is currently available on kystandards.org and we've linked it here on the slide deck for you as well. We are releasing the Math Consumer Guide next month, so in April, so please watch the Standards Newsletter for more information about that upcoming release. Now, we recognize that the market is a whole lot messier when it comes to science and social studies with fewer externally validated resources even available, and this is a big topic of conversation at both the state and the national level right now. So until we have consumer guides available for these two content areas, we recommend that you use the instructional resources alignment rubrics um, that, uh, again, linked here are available on kystandards.org for science and for social studies. Then once the district has adopted um, the HQIRs, it then is going to be used um, as uh, the curriculum development team really then takes the HQIR to develop the cur local curriculum document. And that local curriculum document then really serves as a roadmap for the teachers. And it is going to create those common set of expectations of what needs to be utilized from that HQIR to ensure those equitable opportunities for all students and, and really making sure you have that alignment back to your instructional vision. For the next objective in section two, we want to spend some time discussing the role of curriculum based professional learning to support implementation. We might begin to define curriculum based professional learning as professional learning that doesn't just orient teachers to using a curriculum and its HQIRs, but professional learning that makes the curriculum and HQIRs educative so that teacher content knowledge, pedagogy and practices can grow through what using the curriculum and HQIRs make available. To consistently affect the quality of instruction in order to then begin to systematically achieve improved student outcomes, the quality of professional learning must be high. Said another way, improved student outcomes require more than an instructional vision and access to a local curriculum and HQIRs, it needs the ongoing support of high quality professional learning. Phase four of the CDP focuses on implementing and monitoring the curriculum to make necessary adjustments in order to support uh, continuous improvement. For our purposes, however, we will consider the visual on this slide um, and we're gonna be looking at the role providing ongoing professional learning plays as the district strives to get closer to realizing the aims of its instructional vision in all classrooms and what it means when high quality professional learning is curriculum based. This is a visual from the elements transforming teaching through curriculum based professional learning, and it does a nice job of lining out significant shifts that occur when professional learning transitions from traditional teacher professional development to curriculum based professional learning. Something to note before we dive in is all traditional professional development might not be quite like this or quite this traditional. So let's crosswalk these a moment to help us process the shift. So we, we see a shift from a focus on topics and themes to a focus on instructional materials with specific teaching strategies. And this is important because the strategies that are focused upon are emerging from the actual materials and resources that teachers are using. The growth and the gains they make then feeds immediately right back into what they're doing with those same materials and resources so that transfer uh, happens more consistently. We see a shift away from one-time workshops, uh, usually when school is closed, to repeated sessions, coaching and feedback opportunities during teachers' regular work days. So the learning is now ongoing instead of one off and job embedded. Teachers grouped by school, which sometimes can result in kind of haphazard groupings, to teachers grouped by the, by the immediacy of the curriculum they're actually using. Information shared in lectures, presentations, or Q&A discussions. So here we have the mode of the professional learning. 
to active learning experiences, such as practicing instruction or participating in lessons as students. So see the symmetry between the student experience and the active learning we want there, and then the active learning we now want for all our, adult, all our, our adult learners as well. Coaching and feedback reserved mostly for new or struggling teachers, and these last two tie into teacher equity, to curriculum focused coaching and feedback for all teachers and selected teachers receive support for using new materials to, again, all teachers using those new materials, participating in curriculum based professional learning. So let's briefly map this preliminary sense of curriculum based professional learning onto what it might be like for teachers in your local context. Please look over these shifts again and consider teachers in your district and which shift might hold the most value for them. Now, value in terms of meeting their needs or in terms of maybe simply just being appreciated by them. So I'll invite you again to reflect individually on what you find in lieu of the paired sharing called for on the slide. So please pause and do so now. Okay. So as our learning has continued to unfold and we're in conversation nationally with folks in this work, we have recognized a distinct need to develop specific supports, protocols, resources, tools, et cetera, to help districts in this transition. And we're currently working on that. So be watching for resources to support the space of curriculum based professional learning. So now we're moving into section three, where we're going to focus on the importance of stakeholder communication and inclusion throughout the curriculum development process. And we only have one objective for this section, and that is to allow you to be able to explore our new tool, the communication plan template, and discuss ways that you might strengthen stakeholder communication and inclusion back in your district as it relates to curriculum work. Going back to lessons learned from the reading and writing and math pilots, another lesson that they shared with us was the critical importance of stakeholder communication and inclusion in each phase of this process. And that was really to help uh, develop understanding around the work and why it was important, but also to really build that necessary buy-in support and commitment for actual implementation. This is also important as we take into consideration Senate Bill 1 from 2022, which was passed into law last July, and it's now a part of KRS 16345. And this law shifted the responsibility for developing the curriculum and selecting instructional resources away from each school site-based council to the local superintendent. And if you look at the language of the law, it says that this work is to be done in consultation with each school site based council and the local board of education. And it also calls for a reasonable review and response period for stakeholders throughout the process. The United We Learn vision for public education in Kentucky also highlights this as well with its emphasis on vibrant student experiences, encouraging innovation and collaboration with our communities. While the curriculum development process can support all three themes, we focus primarily on how it helps to facilitate vibrant student experiences and content area learning while providing multiple opportunities for collaboration with stakeholders throughout the process. So to assist districts in thinking through the stakeholder communication and inclusion as it relates to their curriculum work, we've created this new tool called the communication plan template. Um, again, you do have access to this in your participant folder, and I just want to walk you through the way that it's set up. First of all, notice those hyperlinks at the top. They are built to hyperlink within the document itself. So like if you were to click on phase two, it'll take you to the phase two portion um, or section in this document. And you can see that there is a section for each of the four phases of the curriculum development process. So what you're going to see for each phase is in the first row, it is going to contain some questions that you would want to think through and address regarding stakeholder communication and inclusion as it relates to the work of that particular phase. So those questions will change in each phase because again, they, they basically are connected to the actual work that happens in that phase. Now, the second row will actually stay the same for each phase. It is aligned to the research on what makes for effective communication and the key areas that you want to address. And so what we want to do is just pause and give you an opportunity to individually explore this tool. And as you look at those first two rows for each phase, begin to think about which of those considerations might help strengthen stakeholder communication and inclusion back in your district as it relates to curriculum work. So pause the video and restart after exploring the tool.
As we close our time together and before we get to the standards updates for science and social studies, um, we want to think back on these sections with some reflection. So as we do so, let's reset the goal for the session. We are learning about developing a strong local curriculum supported by a primary HQI or primary HQIRs plural to help strengthen tier one instruction. In section one, we walk through the importance of a common instructional vision. In section two, we establish the role of high quality instructional resources within a local curriculum. In section three, we then looked at stakeholder communication and inclusion. So drawing upon today's experience now, what is something that resonated with you? What is something from your perspective that seems most urgently needed? What seems especially challenging? And then again, from your perspective, what step might be next for you? So you can record your thoughts for each of these on page two of your participant handout, and we'll pause and allow you to do so now. In our final section today, we're going to focus on the draft cast for science and social studies. As mentioned previously in this session, a common instructional vision is imperative to strengthening tier one instruction and improving student outcomes. Knowledge of the Kentucky Academic Standards is an essential lens through which we develop the instructional vision. We're going to begin this section by exploring the big shifts in the draft Kentucky Academic Standards for Science. To assist in communicating the revisions to the draft CAS for Science, we have created an at a glance document that is located in your digital folder. In the digital folder, you will also find the draft CAS for Science document. We'd ask you to pause and open that document now. Within the document, one of the big shifts was the inclusion of the writer's vision statement. This can be found on page six. We'd like to give you a moment to read through the writer's vision statement and consider what do those foundational beliefs mean for the student experience in K-12 science. There's space on page two of your participant handout to record your thinking. In addition to the writer's vision statement, the new CAS for Science includes grade level overviews. These overviews include concepts, skills, and ideas that will be explored at each grade level. We'd like to give you a moment to read through an elementary, a middle, and a high school grade level overview um, and think about how does the overview support the student experience K-12. So access the draft cast for science. You want to go to the table of contents. It is now navigatable, so you can click on the grade level that you would like to view, um, and it will take you to the grade level overview. We'd like for you to reflect and record your thinking on page two of the participant handout. The key elements for the Kentucky Academic Standards for Science did not change, but the organization was updated to make it understandable by teachers and other stakeholders um, in education. So at the top is the performance expectation that describes what students should know and be able to do. Beneath the performance expectation is the clarification statement that helps to give a better understanding of what the expectations are of the performance expectation, as well as an assessment boundary that um, delimits what can be included on large scale assessments. Beneath that are foundation boxes, and this information was included in the original CAST for Science. However, it is organized in a way to better support teacher understanding of the expectations of the performance expectation. So within the foundation boxes, there are the science and engineering practices, the disciplinary core ideas, and the cross-cutting concepts that support that performance expectation. In addition, there were some 
uh, significant, there were some changes made to support those grade level overviews um, just to add more coherence to the standards across grade levels. These are in section six of the at -a glance document and they're listed here on the screen as well. So there were six performance expectations that were modified to add coherence and clarity across the progression and those are listed here and there were eight standards that changed grade levels to better connect to core ideas explored at that grade level. We'd like to give you a moment to reflect what might the shifts in the CAS for Science mean for your vision of Tier 1 instruction? And as a district or building leader, what implications might this have as you consider your local curriculum and professional learning supports for next year? We'd like to highlight some resources that might support you in implementing the CAS for Science. First is the kystandards.org website. We have a science resource page that includes modules such as the implementation guide and the getting to know the CAS for Science um, resource. That module will be updated and available when the new standards release. Additionally, there are um, opportunities from PIMSR um, for science instruction as well. We're going to focus on understanding the impact of the Teaching American Principles Act on the Kentucky Academic Standards for Social Studies. With the passage of the Teaching American Principles Act in the legislative session in 2022, the CAS for Social Studies was opened um, for a specific purpose. KRS 158.196 required the Kentucky Department of Education to open the CAS for Social Studies to incorporate 24 fundamental documents and speeches into the appropriate middle school and high school standards. Now, this does not delay or otherwise impact the regular schedule for the CAS for Social Studies to be reviewed that it will take place in 2025. So this was a very specific opening of the CAS for Social Studies document. On the screen here, you'll see the 24 fundamental documents and speeches. These are also included in the legislative document as well as in the front matter of the draft cast for social studies. These documents are all open source and readily available online. To assist in communicating the revisions to the CAS for Social Studies, we have provided an at a glance document that is available in your digital participant folder. It includes a link that will take you to the draft CAS for Social Studies document on the KSBA website. The standards writers took a dual approach in incorporating the fundamental documents. First, they included relevant documents and speeches in the disciplinary clarification statements of existing standards. And secondly, they recognized the fifth grade standard seen here on your screen as being a model for the inclusion of fundamental documents and used that to create a new eighth grade standard and a new U.S. history standard. You'll notice that the fifth grade standard seen here, students are asked to describe the impact of fundamental documents on the development of the United States and the verb is describe. You'll also notice that this standard includes the word fundamental documents. The original fifth grade standard had the word foundational document, and that was updated to fundamental to align with the legislation. The committee defined fundamental documents as documents that provide significant insight into key actions, movements, or moments, or help establish, establish a precedent or core principle. On the screen here is the eighth grade standard that was created. Um, at this level, students are asked to analyze the impact of fundamental documents and speeches on the development of the United States from 1600 to 1877. This supports the timeframe for the existing standards in eighth grade, and it includes the fundamental documents that align with that period. While these documents and speeches are explicitly stated and must be included, this list does not preclude you from including additional documents and speeches within your local curriculum that help give a full picture of what was taking place during that time period. 
For high school, a new standard was added to the U.S. history strand. At this level, students are asked to evaluate the impact of the fundamental documents and speeches on the development of the United States from 1877 to present. And this time frame allows aligns with the existing standards in this strand and includes the documents and speeches that correspond with events in that time frame. Prior to this revision period, the high school clarification statements were available on kystandards.org. These were adopted into the CAS for Social Studies to support teachers in implementing the fundamental documents. In the draft, K-12 standards include clarification statements, which include some of the fundamental documents and speeches as appropriate to support instruction. It will be important for teachers to review these across K-12. To fully understand the shift in the CAS for Social Studies with the inclusion of the fundamental documents, it is important to understand the role that disciplinary clarification play in the CAS document. The disciplinary clarification statements are K-12. The documents were added to provide coherence across the K-12 progression. We'd like to take a moment for you to reflect as a district or building leader, what implications might this have as you consider your local curriculum and professional learning needs for next year? Pause the video here and you can record your thinking on page three of your participant handout. While having students analyze sources has always been part of the CAS for Social Studies, the statutory changes present an opportunity to provide professional learning experiences that support educators with sourcing. In order to support educators with sourcing, the KDE is developing the Supporting Students and Using Evidence module. The goal is to empower educators to be able to support students in understanding and using resources. Educators will have the opportunity to learn about the different types of sourcing, how sourcing works within the inquiry practices of the CAS for Social Studies, and how they can manage sourcing in order to support comprehension. The KDE expects this module to be released at or before the adoption of the standards. Additional resources can be found at the kystandards.org website. We have a social studies resource page that includes modules such as getting to know the CAS, um, supporting inquiry practices, minding the gap, um, that helps to identify and support gaps that may exist in the local curriculum. Additionally, there is an implementation guide um, that includes sort of an overview of professional learning modules that are available and that will support you in really um, analyzing where a best start is for your professional learning. As we wrap up today, I want to uh, lift up some opportunities to stay plugged in to what is happening in the Office of Teaching and Learning. As we mentioned earlier in this session, the KYMTSS website has a lot of resources, but you can also sign up for the newsletter by clicking the link that is um, pointed out here on your screen. Um, that's the best way to be kept apprised of everything that is um, coming out of the Office of Teaching and Learning regarding MTSS in the state of Kentucky. Additionally, the kystandards.org website has a place for you to sign up for a newsletter, and that is the best way to stay informed of information and resources that are coming from the Office of Teaching and Learning. We want to thank you for your time today. In the digital folder, there is an ELA certificate that you may complete for credit. Also, we have a survey here on the screen. If you would complete that and let us know what you thought of your professional learning experience today, we're always eager to hear from you and improve our offerings. We know that as you go back to your school and district, you may have questions that come up. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. Our contact information is on the screen here. We are glad to be thinking partners with you, and we thank you for your time today.